Hi, and welcome to Comic Talk. I'm Joshua. And I'm Drew. This is our weekly poll, poll list review. Poll, poll list review. For uh, October 19th. <laughs> the longest introduction <laughs> ever. Okay, so this week we have five titles to talk about. We are going to talk about Cave Carson in the Cybernetic Eye, or has a Cybernetic Eye? First issue. Astonishing Ant-Man, number 13. Doctor Strange, number 13. Archie, number 13. And Fuck Fairyland, number 10. So let's start off with the number one that we have here. Uh, this is DC's Young Animal pop-up imprint thing, uh, curated by Gerard Way. Uh, Cave Carson has a cybernetic eye. Uh, it's Rivera, Way, Oming, and Filardi. So in case you didn't catch, Cave Carson has a cybernetic eye. And he's having problems with it. Yeah. And it's giving them hallucinations and shit. So, yeah. This issue, I think, in a lot of ways, was like conceptually your standard first issue in that it did a lot of world building and character introduction and whatnot. But it did it in a very snapshot of a situation kind of way. It was almost like it gave you the scenes of like random scenes for a movie. But then based on that, like you can pretty much tell what the movie was about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I read a, a uh, interview, I think it was with Way, it may have been with Rivera, it might have been with both of them, where they kind of talked about how the original Cave Carson and the Cybernetic Eye story was kind of an adventure title and he just has the eye and it's never really explained. It's just, he just has a cybernetic eye, and it's just part of what he does. And they really talked about how what they want to do with this is get into that. Like, mm -hmm. okay, it's always just taken for granted that he has the eye, and nobody ever talks about it. So what the fuck is this eye? Like, what is it, right? Sure. It's such a... And uh, you can see the beginnings of that, and they hint at that a lot with, like, he's talking to his daughter, and, and she says, yeah, I know we never talk about the eye, but can we please talk about the eye? Like, what is up, you know? And uh, there's just a lot of weird stuff going on with it. It's not just a tool that he can use that's just part of his character. Like, it, it seems to be the driving force... Of the plot right now. Of the plot, right. Uh, so what did you think? Do you, it's, it's a bit odd, isn't it? Yeah, there were a couple funny spots that I think were nice because overall it was a pretty intense read. I think just because of the kind of erratic structure of it but i enjoyed it overall yeah so did i and there was some uh fun like pop culture uh homages that i liked that were in here that i won't spoil because they're fun when you see them uh if you catch them mm -hmm. and it did have this weird balancing act where it's kind of like you said like just a a snapshot comic book story old school adventure thing happening but it's weird too. Like it has this strange element that is reminiscent of the other young animal stuff we're reading, where there's definitely some off kilter stuff that isn't explained to you. It's not, it's not spoon fed to you, sure. which is what I like about young animal so far in comparison to the rest of Rebirth, where they really, it's a fun light adventure story feeling kind of thing, but it doesn't feel. Spoon fed. Uh, right. I feel like, like they're um, they're treating me with respect, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like woven threads as opposed to a string. Right. Yeah. Right. And they just give you pieces of it and let you... You just have to be okay with not knowing exactly where you're going. You know, you're not just mm -hmm. getting pulled along with, okay, now we'll investigate this thing. It, it right. leaves a little bit to the imagination as well as just to... The future, like you're not, you don't, I have no idea what this is really about yet, which takes a certain kind of readership and a certain level of editorial insight and, and hands-offishness to allow, right? Sure. Which, given that this is uh, at least partly written by Way, so 
you know, he's kind of got the final say on, well, can I do this boss? Well, I'm the boss, so yes, right. I can. So I can do what I want. But yeah, I mean, like you mentioned earlier, a lot of the young animal titles have been like this. And I think true to that form, once we get issue two of this, I think it'll start coming together in a slightly more classic kind of way, just because we have more stuff, mm -hmm. you know, so we'll see what's important right now. Yeah, I also, I really like that uh, we have Michael Avon Oming on the art here. He did Powers, hmm. uh, and I really liked Powers back in the day. I really liked his art on that. It's this cool, uh, kind of cartoony, almost, you know what it almost reminds me of? Like Bruce Timm, uh, Superman the Animated Series, and the Batman Animated Series. It's got sure. that kind of vibe to it where uh, it's cartoony and angular, but also just a little bit adult to it. Like, it, yeah. it doesn't feel like it's for a child. It just feels like it's drawn for people who, as children, liked cartoons. You know what I mean? Sure, yeah. It's, uh, a, it's an odd line. Yeah, and it's fun watching him play a little more into the weirdness uh, mm -hmm. because Powers was a little bit more straightforward. Sure, sure. So I like seeing him do this. It's kind of cool. Definitely. Uh, let's move on over to the Astonishing Ant-Man number 13, uh, Spencer Schundover, Schunover, Rosanus, Boyd, and Quintana. So they, they brought in another artist guy to work on this one along with the normal team. I think he's been on one or two other issues throughout, kind of helping fill in Possibly. as needed. Not sure. The, well, there's the trial deciding whether or not he'll go to prison for his daughter's crimes. And surprise, shit goes awry. Yeah, um, this was a little less serious than the last one. A I little felt bit. Like, well, yeah, there was pretty. It was there was a lot of goofiness, but uh, there was still a lot of those of that serious side that he likes to throw into here, especially when it comes to Carrie, mm -hmm. right, the daughter, and uh, that's something I've liked a lot in this series throughout is how it can be really goofy and jokey. But when she's involved, he becomes much more serious, and the writing reflects that in a mm -hmm. way that it really makes it feel rounded and, and real. Like, it, I, I buy the character so much more that he has something that he really takes seriously and gives a shit about and tries his hardest on, uh, even if he fails at it. And that's really a lot of what this is about. Like, it gets into that quite a bit, and I think it does it really well. Yeah, it's a really smart technique to change the tone of the book completely based on the subject matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't think of a lot of other examples of that. And this, yeah, is a very serious issue. Like, um, I was really looking forward to getting some good laughs out of it, and for the most part, I didn't. But it was a really good read, mm -hmm. you know. And it had some really funny moments too, though. Like it wasn't. It, a couple. it wasn't all straightforward, uh, and there was a lot of bombastic goofiness to it, with you know the battle in the court and mm. uh, just a lot of good. I thought there was a good amount of fun stuff in here, it, but it's a good mix. I, I think it's a great ending to the trial. I. I had said last issue that I wouldn't be surprised if the trial was just like one page and then like something new. Uh, so it, it was surprising to me. I didn't think they would use the whole issue to do just the end of the trial, but they did. Mm -hmm. uh, and it worked really well. It worked better than I could have expected. It did work really well. There were enough like goofy Ant-Man turns and stuff that it just uh, kept it fresh. There's a lot of just random crap that happens in this story sometimes. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah, and I'm excited to see, because we really have no information about what's going to happen in the next arc. Right. Like, I mean, this is just like a wrap-up. There's no loose ends on, like, mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. As far as I can tell, like, there may be something that I didn't think about. But Right. I'm sure there is. There's always the power broker. That's true. Um, and the guy's dad, right? So, but uh, and he's got to get his business back. I mean, shit. Yeah, you know? yeah. They, but you're right. He really did kind of end things here. Uh, is there going to be more? Is there going to be Ant Man and Stinger now? Is that going to be a thing? I haven't seen any solicits. I'm not sure. That'd be cool. I'd yeah. be up for it. Um, Hopefully, he's not leaving. It'd be lame. If he does, if he is, if he does leave, if this was it, I feel like this was a pretty successful ending. And it was a good run. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, not it's not just thirteen issues. There was a whole like what ten and ish before this. Yeah, yeah. So that's a long time working on it, man. Yeah, it was good. Now let's move on. Let's talk about Doctor Strange number thirteen. Aaron Bacallo, Fabella, and 
Tartaglia. So in the last issue, we saw him melt into a puddle. And in this one, we see that he went to... Well, I don't want to, like... Right. Yeah. Sure. He, he has to deal with Nightmare, who yeah. uh, pretty obviously deals in nightmares. So that's kind of what we get, right? A mm -hmm. uh, little bit of a spoiler, but you can't really talk about it without it. And it, come on, it's obvious, right? Sure, sure. How did you feel about this one? For, like, kind of a one-shot issue, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, just the manner in which it was told, I think, was really successful. It seemed like a really well-crafted standard-ish kind of idea. Mm -hmm. I agree. I had a lot of fun with it. I really like some of the ideas he's bringing here. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the comparison to his past as a surgeon, mm -hmm. to what it's like to be like a sorcerer. I really liked those comparisons. And I think that those make uh, a really cool avenue for the future where, you know, like what makes a really great surgeon is kind of the same thing that makes a great sorcerer. And I like this idea. I think this will be a lot of fun and fruitful moving forward. Yeah. This idea that you have to know a lot, you have to see and understand what it is that you're working with, but then what really makes you great is to be able to like do new stuff, to be the guy that's, you know, trailblazing mm -hmm. forward. It's, mm -hmm. it's not so much knowing all the spells from the past. Now it's going to be creating his own and coming up with his new his own ways of doing things yeah. which i think and is a lot cooler navigating the new landscape or labyrinth or book right yeah. so i i liked that a lot about this because i feel like that's the main takeaway that he's trying to give us here is is that you know he's the guy who can see how it all goes together and mm -hmm. now he's got to be the one that creates the new status quo for some reason i always love like interdisciplinary uh, examinations like that and I mm -hmm. can't really explain why I think it's just mm -hmm. it's a fun thing to do I also just in terms of story flow on this one I liked his whole nightmare and how it increased and it was a little bit silly with Wong like delivering the pizza sure. and and uh, whatever her name she has that weird name uh, Zelna or something like that right sure with her dumping books down the down the chimney mm -hmm. you know it was so goofy but it's like a fun dream logic and, and the women kept piling up yeah. there's like one scene where there's like 30 of them yeah. in the room and he's like I could swear there weren't this many of you <laughs> just a minute ago uh, I thought that was really great and also kind of the wrap up of how he got out of it with like my hands aren't supposed to work what's going on here and he just like pulverizes his own hand I thought that was really cool that was really cool and we get kind of an open ending to this so I'll be interested to see where that goes. I'm not familiar with like a lot of these Marvel characters, so right. I don't know who the hell she is, but yeah. seems like somebody he would associate with. Yeah, yeah, it looks cool. Let's move on to Archie number 13. This is Wade and Isma. Is this the same guy that did art last time? I think it is, isn't it? I think it? so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Veronica is in a private school in Switzerland now, and she's meeting new people and going through new situations. And, uh, you know, the boys are back in town. Mm -hmm. And this is really, this is mostly a Veronica story. Mm -hmm. uh, it spins like a, there's kind of backup story happening, you know, a, a, the beeline. Yeah. That's, uh, that's Archie and Betty going through the same thing, uh, which I thought was cleverly done, but it's a small part of this one, right? Sure. Uh, but uh, we have... Like, all the way through there, it's like these six-panel stories where he's on one side and she's on the other, and they're having a mirror uh, situation. Like, the same things happen to each right. of them. They end up in the same place. Uh, but they don't... What I thought was clever there is they don't interact. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Even when it's, like, obvious that they would normally, you know, it's like, no, that's just a little storytelling trick. Yeah, and their lives are stay separate, even though mm -hmm. they're so similar, right? which I thought was good. Yeah. Uh, on the Veronica side... Uh, we get a pretty classic, like, Carrie, Mean Girls kind of story here. Uh, how'd you feel about that? I mean, I, I pretty much saw it coming, you know. Um, on the cover, we see that we're going to get introduced to this Cheryl Blossom lady, and I wasn't sure, like, what role she was going to take. So it was, if nothing else, it suspended the establishment of a new character just a little bit which I think is good. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I think it does a good job of continuing to paint Veronica in a much more broader, uh, soulful approach. You know? Yeah, that's true. It was a very like endearing thing for for Veronica. Right. Yeah. So I thought that was good uh, because you know you're supposed to like her. Mm -hmm. uh, classically, you know, everybody is supposed to kind of take a side in the love triangle between Betty and Veronica and Archie, and there's supposed to be as many Veronica fans as there are Betty fans. It's not. You know, Betty's cool and Veronica's a bitch. They're right. both cool in their own way. Uh, and I think this does a good job of continuing to push that narrative forward. Of look, sh she's different. She's very much not like Betty. She's very rich and mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, privileged, but she's not a, an awful person. And right. He's really went to pains to show that, and I think putting her with other people of like her say in her same class. Mm -hmm. Status. Status uh, does a good job of further illustrating that. Although it's not the most interesting issue, it does achieve, I think, what he set out to do, which is to show, you know, he, she's not defined by that one characteristic. Mm -hmm. And I think it is kind of interesting in, like, the way that it ends, because didn't wasn't there something about um, this issue being, like, final issue and the last issue? Yeah, I thought so, too. Yeah, so I don't know if this is going to split off and have, like, a Cheryl and Veronica series. Like, is that going to happen? Or was it just, like, this last issue of the storyline? Or I mean, I'm, I don't really know what the next issue is going to have. Yeah. Or if there's... I mean, I don't know if Wade's going to be writing whatever issue spends off of this. Yeah, I don't know. And, I mean, there's already Betty and Veronica, which is actually right. good. And I think when that trade comes out, we will probably do a thing on it. I read the first issue and it's pretty cool. Cool. Uh, it's very like alternative and, and uh, even f further out than you would expect from reading this stuff. Uh, awesome. So we'll probably get to that. So I doubt that it's going to be like a Cheryl and Veronica because we already got Betty and Veronica that's sure. you know doing a good job uh, and very interesting read. But yeah, I don't know what's going on. I, it, it's hard to decipher what's happening here. Mark Wade, we need answers, dude. Yeah. Let's jump over. We got one more. Let's go to Image and talk about Fuck Fairyland, number 10, uh, Scott Young and Jean-Francois Ball. Just every time it gets worse. <laughs> There's two doors that Gertrude can go through, and he can probably guess what happens. Um, but we spend a lot of time in this issue in the future of dealing with consequences and stuff like that. This is my favorite of this arc. Of this entire arc. Mm -hmm. I really liked this one a lot. I could have done with uh, just crazy between seasons jump forward in time. Mm -hmm. You know how that happens sometimes in like a TV show? Like, oh, now it's five years later. I totally could go with a whole arc of post-apocalypse. Oh, definitely. Uh, Gertrude and her band of, of, you know, warriors. I thought it was fantastic. I loved the characters. I loved her forward in time, like 30 years, still being like the same piece of shit, but like... I think it was like 100 years. Yeah, whatever it was, yeah. but with like just a whole group of other people around her that have, have banded to her. Right, yeah. I mean, reading this, I was almost sad. Uh, when she went back at the end because it's like, you know, some of those characters were just so interesting and, you know, I was just picturing in my mind like the group dynamics, you know, with these new characters and stuff. And then like she goes back and it's like, well, fuck, like, right. what if we never see him again? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it does, though, give us a chance to maybe see... I, I guess it, it lets us see his long-term idea of like who these characters are and who they might become. And also maybe gives us a glimpse into who he thinks is important in the world, mm -hmm. right? Like the what, Belinda the witch, right, was mm -hmm. in there. And there, there were some characters we've seen that were with her, as well as Duncan, right? Dinosaur yeah. Duncan. Uh, we understand now that a bunch of crazy shit happens with him over the years, mm -hmm. and you know he's he gonna be around. like yeah. a huge bad guy, awesome character. Uh, so there's some fun to be seen there. Uh, and I just liked the whole idea of this with, you know, this repeating idea where she just can't focus and pay attention, you know, and that's yeah. like her main downfall and always has been. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that they distilled the story down to that and made a great joke about it, you know. That's what I was going to say is the other focus of this issue was just 
another illustration of like how she's kind of a piece of shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's yeah. the moral of the yeah. story. You know, and uh, just really nails that home with the whole attempt to do something about it and then fail miserably. Right. Yeah. It just is what it is. Yeah, and it yeah. it was also a lot of fun. Uh, sort of near the end when she does go back in time. I loved that illustration of like three hours of her like trying to explain it in her idiot Gertrude sort of way. Like not only is young Gertrude like garbage, you know, but really she she's still better. not any better like a hundred <laughs> years later. Like she yeah. goes through all this work and still can't explain like this simple like she can't just say, you know, go that way. Well, yeah, you know what I mean? the, the problem was that uh, she made mention of the fact that every decision that Gertrude made was the wrong decision. So, you know, in her mind, there's just a laundry list of, God, you're going to fuck up like here and here and right. here and here and here and here. <laughs> when, yeah, the good idea would have just been like, you know, one step at a time, just go this yeah, way. Yeah, take a like, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll hold your hand and walk you yeah. down this way. Yeah, it's yeah. such a simple s solution and she just can't grasp it, you yeah. know. So, I. Uh, but just, I thought that there it was a return to form in a lot of ways. I loved the po the four pages of white. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was a bold, fun choice. Uh, and just him, just the whole story with Larry from that point until those white pages was great. You know, they always tell, he always tells such strong, poignant and funny stories with and about Larry, I think he's really the the unsung hero of right. the whole story. And they're always really concise too. It's like a couple panels, and it's just like all this super deep, insightful information. Right, yeah. right. And it's just this dark, like Shakespearean comedy when yeah. it comes to Larry. And it, it, you're right. It's very concise humor and concise storytelling. It's mm -hmm. it maybe the bright spot of this whole series when you look back at it is what he does with Larry. Well, it's his flexing of his uh, writer muscles. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's when it comes out. Uh, did you read the little thing at the end? Yes, I did. Yeah, okay. So in that, he talks about how the first arc to him was more like a sprint, I think was the metaphor he mm -hmm. used, whereas this one was more like a stroll. And I think I would agree overall. And um, I just really like the fact that he kind of saw it the same way that we were, you know, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, we ended up complaining about it a lot if we're being real. Right. But the important thing is he says this was, these two arcs have been establishing sort of the dichotomy of what the, he's going to The bookends. Right. right. What he's going to be working with. So I'm super excited for the next arc, even though it's apparently a couple months away. Yeah, I'm excited as well. And the fact that he says he has a 10-story arc or 10 issue arc uh, mm -hmm. already in mind is pretty great because mm -hmm. we really felt the second this second arc the real problem was that it didn't feel particularly planned that it was more sure. one shoddy and a little bit more just meandering about uh, so the fact that he hasn't you know another plan. big plan like he had originally I think uh, says a lot yeah and he says there's also going to be like some one and done issues so you know I think it really will be like um, smatterings of each, you know, yeah. if not within issues, then within like the arc. Which I think is actually perfect. Yeah. You know, that's that's what I would want ideally is to have this stuff that we had in the second arc smattered in between what we had in the first mm -hmm. to help elongate it, right, and really get the most out of it. Yeah. Get the detours in the middle of something bigger. Sure, sure. All right, well, we got a Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr, too. Yeah, and uh, we have discussed a little bit, uh, let's talk about this just for a moment, uh, of maybe over the next season or so, this winter, maybe experimenting a little bit with format. Sure. Uh, we're just talking about it right now, so if you have any ideas or thoughts about things you'd like to see us do that we haven't done, uh, let us know. Also... Uh, our pull list stuff we've talked about maybe changing the format here maybe doing talking about all of Marvel one week from the last month and then talking about all of DC that's one of the ideas that we have on the table you're doing bi-weekly you're doing monthly sure uh, so let us know what you think about that if you'd like to see us maybe do longer form uh, pull list uh, about a longer term of stuff if you'd like to see us break it up more if you want to see us keep doing it exactly like we're doing it now uh, we could also break it up into more 
uh, episodes to where you could watch us maybe just talk about Archie or just talk about Doctor Strange and you can choose which ones you want to watch and which ones you don't. Uh, these are all options on the table, so let us know what you think. If you have any ideas about how we should do things moving forward, if there's anything you would like to see us change, because it's kind of that time of year to start playing around and trying some new stuff. Yeah. Playtime is now. 